Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are joining us from. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the presiding officer, Brigadier General Terry Bullard, Commander, Office of Special Investigations, welcome to this ceremony honoring Colonel James S. Mehta as he is decorated for his service to and then retired from the United States Air Force. Military ceremonies are steeped in tradition. They are the product of customs, courtesies, and rituals our institutions have practiced for many years. While this ceremony is a military tradition, having you all virtually present is not. Colonel Mehta and his family are disappointed you are not physically with us, but thank all of you for honoring them with your virtual presence today. Since this is a virtual event, there will be certain portions of the ceremony that will not commence. I do ask that you respect the traditionally given cues to rise and be seated. During our national anthem, military members stand at attention. U.S. civilians are invited to salute the flag by placing right hands over their hearts. Our ceremony is about to begin. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the arrival of the official party and remain standing for our national anthem. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening once again. Welcome to the retirement ceremony, recognizing the accomplishments of Colonel James S. Mehta as he culminates a long and distinguished career of service to our country, our Air Force, and the Office of Special Investigations. There are two distinct ceremonies that we are going to hold here today. The first, a decoration ceremony, 
will recognize the contributions made by Colonel Mehta during his tenure as the Director, Strategic Programs and Policies, Headquarters, Office of Special Investigations. And the second, the retirement ceremony, will recognize a service member who is retiring from a career of long and honorable service. It is one of the oldest traditions in the military and one of the highest honors we can bestow on a departing member and their family. We come together today both in person and virtually to say thank you to Colonel Mehta and his faithful service, to wish him good luck in his future endeavors, and to bid him farewell as he transitions from the ranks of the active force. We begin today's events with introductions. First, I would like to welcome Colonel Mehta's family and friends. In person today, we have Colonel Mehta's wife, Dr. Michelle Mehta, and their children, Sarah and Andrew. Watching online, we have Colonel Mehta's parents, Shale and Joanne Mehta in Santa Barbara, California. Colonel Mehta's sister, Julie Mehta Russell, and her husband, Ed Russell, both 1989 graduates of the Coast Guard Academy and Coast Guard veterans, and their children, Cadet Third Class Chris Russell, a cadet at the Air Force Academy, and Samantha Russell, all joining us from San Diego, California. Colonel Mehta's sister, Christina Mehta, and her children, Sophia, James, and Stephen Prendeville, joining from Fort Myers, Florida. Colonel Mehta's youngest sister, Amy Mehta, joining from Los Angeles, California. Colonel Mehta's brother-in-law, Eugene Still, and his wife, Rebecca, and their daughter, Lucy, joining us from Albany, California. And Colonel Mehta's brother-in-law, Paul Still, and his daughters, Izzy, Lizzie, and Maddie, joining us from Concord, California. Colonel Mehta also has a number of aunts and uncles and their families joining us from around the country. Also joining this virtual ceremony are several distinguished guests. OSI's Executive Director, Mr. Jude Sunderbrook. OSI's Vice Commander, Colonel Shan Knuckles. OSI's Command Chief Master Sergeant, Chief Karen Byrne Flint. To all the other distinguished guests joining us virtually, thank you and welcome. We would also like to extend a special welcome to other family and friends of the Meta family, directors and commanders, chief master sergeants, fellow veterans, Colonel Meta's classmates, and the men and women of the Office of Special Investigations. Ladies and gentlemen, we are currently experiencing unprecedented times with several crises hitting us and hitting our nation all at once. I please ask that you join me in a moment of silence for our nation and especially to those who have suffered and have been affected by the current COVID and social unrest. Thank you. Whatever retirement means to each of us, today's ceremony is indeed a special occasion to the OSI family. We come together today representing our nation, our service, and our agency to pay our respects and honor a valued member of the Air Force who served faithfully and honorably for over a quarter of a century in dynamic and challenging environments, some of which you'll hear about today. For the Colonel's family, for his immediate family, it is often said that a one-hour ceremony is simply inadequate when it comes to saying thank you for so many years of service to the Air Force, OSI, and our nation. And also as well to those family members who have served as part of that sacrifice. And while this may be true, we'll do our best today with the time we have to honor this symbolic turning point, recognizing this chapter of life and career to rightly send him off to the next. Now, please allow me to introduce our presiding official for today's events, the 19th Commander of the Office of Special Investigations, Brigadier General Terry Bullard. Thanks, Ark. <clears throat> so, uh, just as Ark said, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you may find yourself in the world. Um, I am uh, excited about this because uh, certainly while it is, a very, it is a very unique ceremony in very unique times, uh, I'm excited at the fact that we have people joining us from all over the world today, uh, literally, uh, to be able to watch and be a part of this. So once again, 
uh, you are groundbreaking uh, in, in setting things up to allow for uh, even larger audiences in the future who would want to come and see you and say hello and uh, bid you farewell. So regardless of those circumstances, I can't tell you how deeply honored I am to stand here with you today, James. Um, you are not only a colonel in the United States Air Force, you are not only a special agent in the United States Air Force Office of Special Investigations, you are my friend. Um, and I will tell you, it means the world to me to be able to be here with you and the family to take part in this. So thank you up front. We'll circle back around to that in just a few minutes. But <laughs> So I do have some taskers to put out here, and that is uh, uh, Sarah and Andrew, since we don't have a big crowd here today, if I tell a joke, you have to laugh twice as loud and twice as long, okay, for anybody. Uh, because you've got to cover now for the entire country, if not the entire world, of people attending. I know, I know. No pressure. No pressure whatsoever, none whatsoever. Um, <clears throat> so James has always been someone uh, that I sought to, to emulate, both personally and professionally. And I will tell you, it makes this ceremony uh, very hard for me today. Um, and I am not going to cry. I've already told myself as we go through this, but I'm, we'll see what happens. And uh, Michelle can run go get me something if I, if I break that vow. But it makes it hard on several fronts. Um, and as I always tell folks at ceremonies um, during retirements, uh, these events are very bittersweet. Um, they're hard in that we lose incredible people with years of talent and dedication from our ranks that you just can't make up. And certainly James is not the exception to that. In fact, I would argue you are the example of that fault. But for me today, it's doubly hard uh, that I will lose knowing that one of my best friends in the entire world uh, is no longer in the ranks for me to call on, to get counsel from, or just to pull me aside and go, Fuller, that's the dumbest thing that I've ever heard. Um, I have always loved that and appreciated it. <laughs> Um, however, these ceremonies are also awesome as well, uh, because we get to see someone who we deeply care about uh, and their families close out one chapter of their life, uh, but then open another one that's full of promise and full of excitement. It really is the payment for all of the sacrifice that you've put down for all of these years. Um, certainly, James, the ceremony <coughs> is that for me. Uh, as it is for all of us, um, uh, and I am so excited for James, but I think I'm more excited for his wonderful family. Um, as we've already heard, Dad's not doing emails anymore, you know, he's not distracted anymore, he's not getting calls at weird hours, that's fantastic. Um, and I will tell you, you guys, James's family, both here and virtually, um, deserve this day as well. Shale and Joanne, it is as James's parents uh, that I turn to you first. For over a quarter of a century, think about that for a minute, think about how old we are. Yeah. Um, over a quarter of a century, uh, you have watched James, James's, uh, James rise in his career, uh, and I know you've often worried about the dangerous work that he sometimes had to do. But from the first time I met James, he has always spoken so fondly of you both. Uh, and it is very clear to anybody who meets James uh, that the home you provided and the guidance that you provided uh, have stuck with him and have made him who he is today. I can only imagine how proud you must be uh, to see him close this chapter and open up the next. Today is true for you. And then there is Julie, Christina, and Amy. James's incredible sisters. So I wish that you were here today because I always enjoy hearing who handed out the beatings, um, who always came out on top in a fight, um, and who gave who the hardest time. Uh, so I will let you guys debate that at some point after this. But I will tell you, whoever can take credit for that, um, I will tell you, um, have a lot of pride in making James as tough and as driven as he is 
So whoever gets to take credit for that, uh, please do. I'll let the arguments commence after. <sighs> Sarah and Andrew, um, there is no doubt in my mind that you were the light of your dad's life. No doubt. Um, whether it's doing awesome in school, championships in basketball, uh, playing the trumpet, or just hanging out at home with mom and dad, uh, I will tell you, your dad never missed the chance to brag on you, to talk about you, to bring you up in a conversation. I know, Sarah, it, yeah. you know, look of surprise on your face. And he never missed a chance. Um, uh, and it, and it's, it's, in, it's always fun to hear what you guys are up to. You both had to give so much uh, of your dad to us. And so... Um, Long hours, uh, time away from home, and sometimes some uncertainty about that as well. Um, for all of that, we thank you and we celebrate you today. And I want you to know this ceremony is about you as well. Um, and finally, we have Michelle, Dr. Meta, the other part of Team Meta. Um, James's amazing wife. Um, so all I heard about in Hawaii when James and I came together for the second time uh, was about this uh, amazing woman that he had met uh, and that he was dating. And so my advice to him was pretty simple. Don't screw it up, Bubba. <laughs> um, and I am so glad that he didn't, uh, that he held on and you guys found a way to make it work because everything that's happened after has just been phenomenal. Um, and I will tell you, Michelle, personally for you, how you have managed uh, to change careers, pursue a PhD, advocate uh, for career issues with military spouses, and become an author, all while supporting James and the kids, is very inspiring to Ashley and to me and to my family on how you managed to lock all of this down, but you did. Um, you have given so much of yourself to others, uh, and it is wonderful to watch you and James um, both excel in your careers and both make a difference in lives. This day is truly about you, Michelle, and I know I speak for James when I say that you were an equal partner in every bit of this and the reason that he was so successful. Our most sincere thanks to you for your years of service and sacrifice. The ceremony is yours as well. All right, so to Sark's point, how in the world do you take 28 years of career, 32 if you count the Air Force Academy, which I kind of count, I'm just looking at <laughs> half credit on, okay, um, uh, of an amazing career in such a short time. And in fact, James gave me marching orders right up front because he knows me. He says, look, make it fast, Bullard. Uh, everyone will have a program and they know exactly where I've been. Um, but, of course, you know for a guy from the South, that's just not going to happen. Um, and for a guy who speaks slow from the South, it's even worse. Um, but I will tell you, I would be remiss if we didn't recount some of the things behind the bio. And if I didn't make a really convincing argument uh, to Michelle, uh, to Sarah, and to Andrew, uh, that their dad is not only their dad, their husband is not only their husband, but he's a hero. So I'm going to give it my best attempt. So still in for just a few more minutes, okay? Don't worry. I, I worked this. I, I jumped it a little bit. Um, very fortunately for OSI, James comes out of the chute and he heads to pilot training. Um, pilot training doesn't agree with him, uh, and you, you know we we do a little bit of soul searching at that point. You know, what am I going to do? Where am I going to go? Am I going to be an engineer? Uh, am I going to be a security forces guy? You know, what am I going to pursue? Am I going to go into acquisitions? Oh my gosh, man. I mean, there was just so much potential. For me, if I had done that, there would have been no other potential because engineering was out for me from the start. Um, but very, very thankfully for OSI, uh, James decides that uh, he's going to pursue a career with us. Uh, and not only was that very fortunate for the command, but it was personally fortunate for me as well. Because when I arrived at Edwards Air Force Base, about as green as they come, 
in the fall of 1993, uh, I meet this incredibly sharp fellow second lieutenant who had it all together. Um, and my first operation as an agent trainee was actually James's case, James's operation, uh, where he had me out, uh, not as an AT, I got to watch, I didn't get out of the car <laughs> like you told me, um, but was actually a, a raid on a work site at Edwards Air Force Base uh, with workers who were not cleared to be there, and in fact, not cleared to be in the country, um, uh, you know, in a highly sensitive area of the base. So from that early moment, I thought James Meadow was probably the coolest guy in the entire world. Um, and um, while just a bit ahead of me career-wise, James became that mentor to me uh, and absolutely shaped who I became as an agent and as an officer very early on, both, giving, both lauding me for good things and then chewing me out when things did not go well, um, which I needed both. Um, so I will, I will forever um, uh, owe James my, uh, my love of forensic sciences uh, because, of course, uh, as the boring married guy at Edwards Air Force Base in Depth 111 at the time, I was ripe material to cover duty agent. And so it was on one of these weekends when I was covering duty agent, and I'm sure James was off on some exciting adventure somewhere, um, that I ended up catching the case. Um, that absolutely altered my career desires on where I wanted to go and what I wanted to do while I was in OSI. Now, I will tell you my lovely bride, Ashley, was not very happy with James for about six months after that um, because this case owned me for a while. Um, but I was absolutely thrilled that uh, in, in doing that, uh, James had shown me exactly what I wanted to do and what I thought my calling would be. But he also showed me in the entire office that it is very important for an OSI officer to become very comfortable in our crim, fraud, and counterintelligence mission. And he did so with wins in each of those areas. So no surprise when James is chosen um, to go directly into the operational and the strategic level um, over the next few years at the Defense Intelligence uh, Agency's Human Service. I guess I can say that now. Uh, and at Region 6 at Hickam Air Force Base. Of course, James excelled in these environments because he's a brilliant guy and could instantly take that field piece of what we had gotten together at Edwards and make it into uh, something at the operational and strategic level to have that discussion. Um, so he did it in a lot of different ways in these jobs. So let me just give you a couple of blurbs real quick from these assignments. He influenced the way the entire command uh, educated the Air Force on counterintelligence awareness. Uh, he was picked as the sole OSI representative for the human services for OSI and even represented DIA itself in councils with CIA and the State Department. Now bear in mind, this is all as a lieutenant and a captain. That's the brilliance that we see in him very early. And he provided early oversight and guidance in the efforts aimed at identifying threats from Al-Qaeda well before 9-11. Leaders said of him at the time, at this early point in his career, uh, top 5% of all officers I have ever known, my best officer, my number one officer, period. Uh, and it's here at Hickam that once again our paths crossed. Um, fortunately for me, James is at Region 6 in charge of all counterintelligence. Um, and I am the commander at 601. And once again, James was not only a friend to me and my family, but a wonderful mentor. And he made me and all the other young commanders uh, in the region uh, far better than we would have been based on his leadership and setting the example for all of us. So no surprise when James is selected to go to AFIT, um, to the lovely Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California, uh, and to the Defense Language Institute in Monterey. And of course, being James, uh, he graduates with a 3.9 GPA from both programs and their equivalent of the Distinguished Graduate category, because that's James, that's what he does. Uh, and then this kicks off this amazing run of command experiences. So from 2002 to 2012, see I told you I jumped it a little bit, um, 
we find James as the DON commander at Det 522 at Insular Air Base in Turkey, as the commander of 206 Nellis Air Force Base, one of OSI's largest and busiest detachments. He took a six-month break from that to go to Baghdad International Airport as part of uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom and run the detachment there as the commander. Then he came back uh, and did a, a stint as the deputy director of the Special Investigations Directorate at the Pentagon. And then we moved him right into becoming the commander of the 4th Field Investigation Squadron uh, at Vogelway Cantonment in Germany. Not a bad run as far as commands and places we want to put people that we want to develop. And there is no surprise that between these command positions and the Pentagon, James shines. A couple of things from this time frame. A uh, key leader in Turkey during the tumultuous time that covered Operation Iraqi Freedom, Enduring Freedom, and Northern Watch. A 400% increase in criminal investigations in Turkey. Pursued historic numbers of cases at Nellis Air Force Base as well. Led 16 airmen in Iraq's combat zone. 130 combat sorties outside of the wire. Uh, eight high-level target packages developed. 23 enemies neutralized off the battle space. It's awfully cool, awfully cool. Stuff that you gotta sit him down and make him tell you about one day. Might scare you a little bit, but make him tell you about it. Uh, he also rewrote OSI's uh, Global War on Terrorism strategy. Uh, he argued for and secured $67 million, which I wish he'd just taken a 10% cut of that. I mean, <laughs> would have been fantastic, right? But a $67 million um, uh, funding for OSI's future cyber threat pursuit and uh, cyber investigations, every bit of which we now benefit from him doing that today in what we do. His leader said of him at this time, the finest major I've known in 22 years. Top 5% of officers I've ever known. Okay, and here's where it just gets, you just start showing off at this point. Uh, number one major in my wing, number three of 127 majors in all of OSI. Uh, number one of 68 IG and OSI uh, lieutenant colonels, not once, but twice on two different reports. Uh, my number one of six squadron commanders, my number two of 73 lieutenant colonels, and my number one of, uh, of 66 lieutenant colonels in OSI. And I had to cut it off there because I know James would cut me off otherwise. <laughs> Um, that's what your dad, that's what those leaders thought of him and saw the potential in him and what he was going to do. And then, of course, during this period, our paths crossed again. This time, this really dirty, smelly, unshaven Terry Bullard shows up from the hinterlands of Turkey, uh, you know, to get some, uh, to get some assistance, um, uh, from my uh, fellow brother who is the Det 520, who's at 522 in Insralik at that point. Uh, and needless to say, James Meta made sure that Terry Bullard did not fail, uh, took care of him uh, while he was in those hinterlands and made sure that not only Terry Bullard, but the entire mission was a success. And so no surprising with this pedigree that we set James up to then move into that strategic level of leadership. Um, he heads on to the uh, National War College, where we only send our very best and brightest. Uh, he is then the Chief of Anti-Terrorism and Force Protection Branch at the J-33 uh, on the Joint Staff at the Pentagon. He is the Commander of OSI's 6th Field Investigative Region at Joint Base Hickam Pearl Harbor. Um, and now is the Director of the Strategic Programs and Requirements Office at Headquarters OSI. And it is in these capacities that James has done amazing strategic level things like being the by name request of everybody in the Pentagon, the by name request to personally review a White House level classified report prior to it being released to protect DOD equities. Uh, he led the joint staff response to the Fort Hood shooting, proposed 11 measures to the uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff who accepted and implemented all 11 of those measures. He led the DOD effort versus uh, ISIS social media targeting of military members in garrison. And he built the way OSI will now think about how we employ CI forces in future war, war, war fighting capabilities uh, in 
in theaters across the globe. And then finally, he overhauled uh, OSI's handling of criminal information reporting and ensured that on the heels of Sutherland Spring that we were able to bring adequate resources to bear and restructure ourselves to make sure that we never have a drop again. And then in a huge legacy piece, the, the one thing that I do want to note uh, of James is his work in prioritizing Air Force technologies um, and making sure that we are squared away and ready to go and really now informs everything that we do for counterintelligence support uh, in the United States and abroad in the way OSI will move forward um, as an agency. During this time, we see him uh, once again excel. Recognized three times at National War College, bear in mind, National War College is where we send our very best and brightest. Three times, he is the number one in either the classes or the papers that he present ranging from international support to um, counterinsurgency operations to uh, uh, strategy on China to national security st studies as a whole. The number one in this very elite group among these teams that look at these things. He was also the number two of 31 joint staff colonels, the number one of 23 branch chiefs within the uh, J-33, and then the number one of eight headquarters directors. And throughout that amazing career, we just see James amass uh, a lot of medals on that chest. Uh, but suffice it to say, big ones like the Legion of Merit, the Bronze Star, the Defense Meritorious Service Medal twice, and the Air Force Meritorious Service Medal five times, with a litany of other joint and other service medals as well. James, my friend, my brother, I have already gone on way longer than you wanted me to, um, but I had no idea, and it's the wonderful thing about doing each and every one of these ceremonies, about some of the things that James did while he was out of my sight. I knew what he did while he was in it, uh, but it was incredible to hear, and I, I think everybody needed to hear that as well. So I finished where I start. I am so honored to stand here with you today, and on behalf of my family, Ashley and all 28 kids, okay? <laughs> um, the OSI family who is all joining in from all over the world today. I thank you, Michelle, um, Andrew, and Sarah uh, for every bit of your service and sacrifice to this country. You've had an incredible career, my friend, and your service to the nation is undoubted. Um, I can't wait to see what is in the future for all of you and what your next step, what your next chapter is going to be. With that, I think I'm going to stop here before you give me the big hook and pull me off the stage um, so that we can get to recognizing you. Sound like a plan? Sounds good. Okay, let's do it. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise as Colonel Mehta is decorated for his service to our nation. Attention to orders. Citation to accompany the award of the Legion of Merit. The President of the United States has awarded the Legion of Merit First Oak Leaf Cluster to James S. Mehta. Colonel James S. Mehta distinguished himself by exceptionally meritorious conduct in the performance of outstanding service to the United States as Director, Strategic Programs and Requirements Directorate, Headquarters, Air Force Office of Special Investigations, Quantico Marine Ground Installation, Virginia, from 7 August 2018 to 30 June 2020. During this period, the exemplary ability, diligence, and devotion to duty of Colonel Mehta were instrumental to organize, train, equip, and assess the command to support the national defense strategy to ensure the nation's security and prosperity. He led the transformation of a new counterintelligence program to protect the Air Force's most critical and innovative technologies from inception through final operating capability. Colonel Mehta leveraged his experience to direct the command's increased collaboration with security forces to refocus criminal investigation efforts on felony level crime and significant fraud to protect the Air Force while increasing counterintelligence efforts. His keen vision led the campaign for over 100 new positions and to write the command's first doctrine to support agile combat employment operations. 
Facing repeated obstacles, Colonel Mehta tenaciously drove the efforts to procure two new handguns for the command to replace a failing and rapidly depleting inventory of the current duty weapon, succeeding in an effort that had repeatedly been unsuccessful for over the last six years. After criminal indexing deficiencies were identified in the wake of the Sutherland Springs shooting, he oversaw command-wide policy which ensured criminal history data were accurately indexed into the national databases, preventing prohibited persons from buying firearms. He established 66 new indexing specialist positions to ensure the Air Force could accurately and consistently criminally index personnel. Finally, during the COVID-19 pandemic, Colonel Mehta directed interim policies to adapt investigative activities using personal protective equipment and social distancing to ensure the agent's safety while continuing vital investigations. The singularly distinctive accomplishments of Colonel Mehta culminate a distinguished career in the service of his country and reflect great credit upon himself and the United States Air Force. Colonel Mehta's daughter, Sarah, will present the medal and citation to Colonel Mehta. standing as we now begin the retirement ceremony. Publish the order. Attention to orders. Special order number Alpha Lima 000365. Colonel Mehta, you are relieved from active duty with the United States Air Force and retired effective 1 July 2020 in the grade of Colonel by order of the Secretary of the Air Force. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. On behalf of General Bullard, Colonel Mehta's son Andrew will present Colonel Mehta with his retirement certificate. The certificate reads, this is to certify that Colonel James S. Mehta, having served faithfully and honorably, was retired from the United States Air Force on the first day of July 2000. Brigadier General Terry L. Bullard, Commander, Office of Special Investigations, and General David L. Goldfein, Air Force Chief of Staff. Accompanying the certificate is a note from General Bullard to Colonel Mehta, personally congratulating him for an exceptional 28 years of honorable and committed service and wishing him and his family the very best as his family moves on to new adventures in the next chapter of their lives. Andrew will now present Colonel Mehta with a certificate of appreciation from the Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, Kayla the Wright, who congratulates the achievements and contributions Colonel Mehta has made throughout his career, which are indicative of the core values of our great service, and thank him for his faithful and devoted service to our nation. Accompanying the certificate is a personal note from Chief Master Sergeant Karen F. Burnflint, OSI's Command Chief, congratulating and thanking him for his service to the Air Force and OSI. Yes. Andrew will now present Colonel Mehta with a certificate of appreciation from our Commander-in-Chief, President, President Donald J. Trump. President Trump extends his personal thanks and sincere appreciation for Colonel Mehta's contribution of honorable service to our country and wishes his best for happiness and success in the future. Today, Colonel Mehta, you will join the elite group of individuals called retirees. So today we make you part of this group with the presentation of the retirement pin. 
A retirement pin is a symbolic token which is traditionally presented to the newly retired member and when worn lets everyone know that another great airman has proudly served their country honorably and faithfully. Dr. Michelle Mehta would, will present this symbolic token to this awesome airman, officer, special agent, husband, and father. And Dr. Mehta would now like to make some comments. I need my kiddos to help with this. So we had a few things to say that we thought we'd put into a poem, which is for you. And this poem is called True Blue. Your friends from your youth say you are true blue. We say not just for the Air Force, but for your family too. You may be putting that uniform away, but I know you will carry it with you. When we met, I found this all a bit odd. Move every two years? Why not just a regular job? But I learned over time that wasn't to be. It's not who you are to do something easy. Your love for your country makes you true blue. Your service is real, and it comes from the heart. You talk about grit, perseverance, and more. I know you would give your life without flinching. And I'm grateful to have a partner so strong. You are true blue to us and will be always, challenging us to be better people, devoting yourself to your family as well. Who else would you see to make costumes and cakes? Your standards are high, but your love is enduring. So family or friends, nation or mission, true true blue you will be all who know you. We are grateful to call you husband and father. There is nobody true or blue. I pledge on my own. Thank you very much. Dr. Mehta, don't, please don't leave just yet. On behalf of General Bullard, Andrew will now present a certificate recognizing you and your continuous support of a, with a certificate of appreciation signed by him and General David Goldfein, United States Air Force Chief of Staff, for the commitment, contributions, support, and sacrifice you gave, which gave strength and purpose to Colonel Meta's career and service. Accompanying the certificate is a personal note from General Bullard, personally thanking you for being the bedrock of the family's home front for you <laughs> For your sacrifice yeah. alongside yeah. Colonel Meta. Yeah. Andrew will now present Dr. Meta with a certificate of appreciation from Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, Caleb O'Wright, who thanks you for the numerous contributions and sacrifices you made in support of our United States Air Force. Just a little bit more. There you go, just like that. Perfect. Roll your collection. Good. I now invite Sarah and Andrew to join the general and your dad. Certificates read, we present these certificates to you on behalf of the OSI commander, honoring you, Sarah, and you, Andrew, for your unfailing support to your father's lasting contributions to the nation. General Bullard would now like to present Colonel Mehta with his retired credentials. Okay, so he said we were going to mask up for this one. Um, 
because this is uh, you know, certainly a, uh, an incredibly special thing for all of us. Uh, and to Michelle's point, sometimes it's, uh, it's very funny when these little small military things you know, take on this huge significance for us. Uh, but I don't think anything does like our badge and credentials. So, my friend, it is my honor to hand these over to you. And whether they stay in this case or whether they get framed and put up on a wall somewhere, I will look forward to seeing them for years to come with a very young James Mehta. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. <laughs> And then James and Wall were up and together. Uh, I wanted to tell you that uh, on, on behalf of the headquarters, uh, the top four, um, just how much your leadership has meant to us. And you heard it in the decorations, the number of things that James and his team uh, moved from point A to point B, uh, every step of the way making the command better. Um, we may come up with ideas, we may come up with proposals. James and his team was the one that breathed life into them and actually made them something for the field. So we got you something with an inscription. We actually got you the uh, OSI command flag print with all of our coins on it. Uh, but I will tell you uh, the saying we thought was very, uh, uh, very apropos, which is from uh, Dr. Kissinger, which is the task of the leader is to get their people from where they are to where they have not been. And James, you've done that over and over again and taken us every step of the way. So let me present that to you, my friend. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Can we uh, shift the over? Oh, shift. Yeah, All right, there shift. we go. Thank you, sir. gentlemen, I present to you now Colonel James Mehta, United States Air Force, retired. Yeah. Retiring was so difficult. <laughs> I, uh, I have um, done a lot of things in the Air Force, obviously, but um, for some reason, retirement has seemed to be the most difficult, both administratively and emotionally. But um, so say it again. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, General Bullard, OSI senior leaders, alumni, family, friends, classmates, and especially the men and women of OSI. I know you're watching from many places around the world and around the country. And it's really so cool to know that so many of you are out there on YouTube watching. The ironic part about doing this ceremony this way, due to social distancing, is that it has given many more the opportunity to attend and actually brings more of us together. General Bullard, Terry, Thank you for being here today. Thank you for your kind words and your extreme hyperbole of my accomplishments. <laughs> my pleasure, my friend. I remember very well when we were just a couple of lieutenants starting out oh, Lord, yeah. and learning to be OSI agents at Dent 111. <laughs> we had some pretty memorable experiences. Yeah. We watched the space shuttle land a few times. Yeah. We helped Her Majesty's Royal Air Force recover classified information from China Lake. We took a trip out to Lone Pine to do some interviews on a reservation. <laughs> yep. And we, we traveled out to Trona, California, which looked like the surface of the moon. Yeah. But it was an exciting and a unique place, Edwards. But I thank you for your friendship and your advice over these years. You say that, that I was ahead of you and, and you followed what I was doing. Well, we were pretty much there at the same time. And, and I feel like every time I went into command, I was calling you for advice. How do I do this? Because you had gone before me. So thank you so much for all your support and your friendship over the years. And I know that uh, we will continue to, uh, to stay close and talk uh, frequently. 
I also can't forget the amazing support from your wonderful family, the amazing Ashley, uh, who I met many, many years ago at Edwards, about 28 to be, 27 to be exact. Yep. Your three older boys who we know well, Dan, Caleb, and Noah, <laughs> and the three little ones, Ashlyn, Annabelle, and Atticus, who we're still getting to know and look forward to uh, seeing and spending time more with. I will truly help miss uh, helping you lead this command. Yeah, me too. Thank you for those who made this event possible. Uh, Colonel Sarkeesian, our narrator and the planner, who did so much work. Major Dat Tran, who did a lot of behind the scenes work and scheduling and putting together the program. Ms. T, our protocol officer, who keeps everything and keeps us proper. Major Womble for streaming and posting this first of a kind streaming OSI retirement on YouTube. As General said, we hope to make this other ceremonies more accessible to our command, which is a global command. And we're so spread out, we sometimes don't get the opportunity to participate in events that we'd like to. Special Agent Terry Krebs, who's taking photos for us to make sure we remember this forever. Thank you. And finally, for the rest of my staff, Lieutenant Colonel Anthony Parkinson, Senior Master Sergeant Andrew Wilson, Senior Master Sergeant Melissa Barbette, Staff Sergeant Dagger, Daggett Schaefer, and especially Master Sergeant C.C. Stevens, who also starts terminal leave this week after 20 years of faithful service. They all help pull me across the finish line that we call retirement. I've been in the Air Force a long time. You've heard, you've heard the numbers, and I've attended a lot of retirement ceremonies through my career. But I never pictured this day would come for me. I can barely remember not being in the Air Force. For so many years when people asked me what to do, I simply told them I was in the Air Force. It was so clear and it was what I was most proud to share. But now it's come the time to move on. The hardest part about doing a retirement this way is that I don't get to see all of you in person today to say thank you for so much that you've given me. For every one of you watching today, you know that you have done more for me than I have done for you. I'm disappointed not to see you face to face to tell you thank you and goodbye. As I told some of you in an email last week, this just gives me the excuse not to say goodbye in the hopes of seeing you again. So instead of goodbye, it will be until we meet again. While it's disappointing not to have you here, I have to remember that those who are facing much bigger challenges due to the coronavirus. Not having a traditional retirement ceremony is truly a small inconvenience compared to those who have paid a much bigger price. Loss of family members or friends, loss of jobs, being isolated, not being able to get critical medical care, and on and on. While it's hard to leave the Air Force and something that's been a part of me for over 30 years, I realize that it's time to go. It's time to leave OSI and the Air Force to the next generation of airmen so they can do what every generation has done before us. Lead our great Air Force to serve and protect the nation. To the current crop of my fellow colonels, to Tito, to Renee Hilton, TJ Joyce, Shan Knuckles, Chris Willett, John Barnett, Scott Kiefer, Amy Bumgarner, Eric Knapp, and many more, it's been amazing working with all of you over the years. It's been tremendous leading o OSI with you. Continue to lead and serve well until it's your turn on this stage, which will be coming soon. Thank you. You're some of my closest friends. Let's go back in history a bit. 32 years ago this month, my parents drove me to the Santa Barbara, California airport to fly to Colorado Springs to attend the Air Force Academy. Basic cadet training in the Academy started on 28 June 1988. When I arrived at the base of the ramp at USAPA, my classmates and fellow graduates out there will know instantly what I'm talking about, and it conjures up indelible memories. After four years, I graduated and got commissioned on 27 May 1992. We passed the 25th, sorry, the 28th anniversary just this last week. Through the magic of the academy, somehow those four years there seemed much longer than the many years on active duty since. When I came into OSI in 1993, I didn't realize the type of organization I was joining. OSI is a small team, a close family within the Air Force. 
There are about 3,000 OSI teammates, and we stay within these circles for most of our career. Therefore, those of us who stay around for a long time, and I have, as you'll see later on, get to know one another very well. During my first assignment at 111 at Edwards, I met some of you that I still know today. Of course, General Bullard recounted many of those events. But there was Stan Crow, Jim McMahon, Rich Miller, Pete Moy, Joe Wentela, Ernie Slatinsky, Dick Harmon, Kelly Harrison, and Joe Williams, who I worked with during those years. In my OSI Academy class, 93C, I learned my badge, earned my badge and credentials with Jim Hudson, Kirk Stabler, and Brian McCombs, among others. Early assignments introduced me to some special mentors, all who helped by coaching me and giving me opportunities. Phil Yasahara, Kevin Jacobson, John Greeson, Mike McConnell, Dana Simmons, Jeff Parker, Bill Beatty, Doug Thomas, Tony Capra, and Howard Carey. These are all names of individuals who have served the command for many, many years. Even before I went to the academy, my air liaison officer was Harry Talbot, who I met as a high school sophomore in 1984. He was so proud of all that I and the other cadets he had helped go to the academy had accomplished. He was truly my biggest cheerleader. He was a friend to so many, and he was the ultimate networker. It is very sad to think that he's no longer with us, but I'm hoping he is somehow present here today. I've made many other lifelong friends in OSI and the Air Force. Marty and Tracy D'Astasio, Mike Philpott, Neil Rappaport, Jay and Jeannie Sim, just to name a few. The last people I want to mention are those I have known the longest in the Air Force. My squadron mates from the Air Force Academy. Don Unwin, my roommate of three years. Bob Seifert. Rob Tobler, all retired from the Air Force of the Reserves. Dave Kumashiro and Steve Wolf, who have retirement plans for later this summer. Kumo from the Air Force and Steve from the Marines since he crossed commission at graduation. But no matter how long it goes by without talking or seeing one of you, when we do, it's like the last time was just yesterday. The biggest thing that's changed is the amount of hair we have and the color of it. <laughs> Thank you, tarantulas and true brood brothers, brothers, for your many years. On the flip side, I've been proud to see younger agents succeed who I've watched growing up in the command. Agents like Tanya Harrison, Aaron Davis, Doug Garavanta, Sashi Yamazaki, Jared Wittenberg, Lauren Allman, Laura DeYoung, Heather Beatty, Kyle McCracken, Chad Hutchins, and so many others. All of those I've named today and many more I didn't mention by name have helped me make it to where I am standing here today. And words are not enough to thank all of you. I can't picture having done something else but the last three decades of my life. I've had the privilege to serve as I have chosen. I have had amazing experiences these last 32 years. I am not a hero. I've had tremendous opportunities. I've shaken the hands of two presidents and worked in the White House. I've traveled over two dozen countries representing the United States and the Air Force. I've lived in Germany, in Turkey, in Hawaii, Las Vegas, Monterey, and our nation's capital. I've jumped out of perfectly good airplanes and flown a couple others. I served with amazing people, both the total force airmen that I was privileged to lead and those who I have followed. I have worked in the Pentagon on the Joint Staff and in the Air Staff. I've come home day after day having been involved in the most important business of our country, our security. Thinking about that is what motivated me for all these years. About five years ago was while I was on the Joint Staff, I was looking at the five or six articles on the front page of the Washington Post. And I realized that I was directly working on or contributing to every one of those issues being reported. How could I not be motivated to serve every day? In the end, I stayed in the Air Force this long because it is what I feel I was called to do. But it didn't start out that way. I originally went to the academy to become a pilot. As General Bullard said, I was betrayed by my inner ear, as I call it, <laughs> and flying was not meant to be. But I stayed in the Air Force so long because I loved what I was doing and, and those I was serving with. But my family didn't make this choice, certainly not my kids. 
And my wife Michelle did, but only did so so that I could serve. Their sacrifice had made my career possible for me. So let me talk more about my family. I know my parents had no idea that I would stay in the Air Force this many years. Maybe they didn't even think I'd stay the whole first year at the academy. I remember when I was in grade school in the late 1970s, or in the 1970s, my mother wanted me to learn to play an instrument, even if it was the drums. Remember, the end of the Vietnam War and the fall of Saigon didn't happen until 1975, and the draft was a major part of that war and that conversation. She told me that if I played an instrument and I ever got drafted, I could be in the band, and that would be much safer than being in combat. <laughs> Unfortunately, despite my Yamaha music lessons, I turned out to be a horrible drummer. Fortunately, the draft ended. However, I ended up volunteering to serve anyway. I know she is very proud of me, Mom, and I made it through my career safely. When I attended a promotion ceremony of a colleague, Jim Anderson, several years ago, he said something that stuck with me. He said that being born in the United States was like winning the lottery. Actually, I think the opportunities and freedoms we enjoy are better than winning the lottery. I remember this line because it is so true. While I had nothing to do with being born here as a US citizen, my parents did. My dad came to the United States in 1960 to study. And after completing graduate school and meeting my mother, he knew he never wanted to leave the United States and he became a citizen. He, like so many other immigrants, know there is more opportunity here than anywhere else on the planet. I thank my parents for all they gave and taught me. It's hard to put my finger on any one thing, but when I see the success, my success and the success of my three sisters, it's clear that they did something right. All three of my sisters have been very successful in different ways. And yes, General Bullard, we had those knockdown, drag out fights. <laughs> my oldest sister, Julie, who went to the Coast Guard Academy and served in the Coast Guard for about eight years, and her husband, Ed, who is also an Academy graduate and Coast Guard veteran. I have two kids with their oldest, Chris, at the Air Force Academy. And my niece, Samantha, is getting ready to start college in the fall. My middle sister, Christina, has three talented and successful kids with two in high school and one in college. Her youngest has goals of attending the Academy. Do you see a trend? Maybe it's the beginning of a tradition in our family. Christina and I lived a block apart during my first assignment in the DC area. And she introduced me to Northern Virginia while it was a short assignment, it was great for us to live so close together for a few years. And my youngest sister, Amy, is excelling in the world of online advertising as a sales executive in LA. While we have lived apart for many years, it's amazing how closely we all think alike. All three of them have always been there for me, and we've come a long way from fighting one another as kids. But my, immediately fam my immediate family has made the most sacrifices for me to have lived this amazing experience. My wife, Michelle, has put her career second and has taken a disproportionate amount of the family responsibility. Having grown up in Berkeley, California, the military was about as foreign to her as aliens. She gave up a successful and blossoming consulting career shortly after we got married. We faced a decision when I was selected for graduate school. If I went, it would mean two years of school followed by a two-year assignment to Turkey, which would pretty much put us on track for at least 20 years in the Air Force. It also meant she would have to quit her job for us to go to Turkey. This was incredibly hard for her to do. During our many moves, she has learned to adapt to the environment and to the opportunities wherever we were. She worked hard balancing being a mom and earning her PhD. During her PhD research, she found something she is passionate about, mentoring and coaching military spouses to better succeed in their working lives within the inflexibility of the military. She checked off a lifelong goal when she published her book, Silent Sacrifice on the Homefront, in January of 2019. When we met in 1996, she asked me how long I had planned to stay in the Air Force. I told her I didn't know, but probably not too long, and it would be influenced by who I married. Well, Michelle, I can finally answer that question. I'm ready to leave the Air Force now. <laughs> Thank you for your support and sacrifice all these years. The next week holds several important days for me and my family. Tomorrow is Sarah's eighth grade graduation and confirmation. Monday is her 14th birthday. And Wednesday is Michelle and my 20th wedding anniversary. 
which means Michelle now has been an Air Force spouse for 20 years and has successfully reached her own retirement. <laughs> for her retirement, our 20th anniversary, I have a gift for her to thank her for her love for those 20 years and for many more to come. Michelle, this is for you. As we all know, military kids sacrifice quite a bit for their parents to serve. They endure their parents' deployments and TDYs. They have to adapt to constant moves, meaning changing schools and saying goodbye to friends. In Sarah's 14 years, she has moved six times and attended three different schools, one of them twice. Andrew, at 10 years old, has moved five times and has attended two different schools. To Sarah and Andrew, my gift to you is not electronics. <laughs> it is to share some life lessons with you that will serve you well in life. Of course, there's an Air Force theme to these life lessons. You know we originally planned to have this ceremony at the Air Force Memorial near the Pentagon. You've seen the memorial, which consists of three stainless steel arcs reaching over 200 feet into the sky, evoking the image of the contrails from the Air Force Thunderbirds in a bomb burst maneuver. But it also represents the three core values of the Air Force. Integrity first, service before self, and excellence in all we do. Whether you ever join the Air Force yourselves, following these three principles will serve you well in your life. Integrity first. I always remind you that this is the most important thing you can do and have. If you live your lives with integrity and you speak the truth, you can never go wrong. Second, service before self. By serving others, you serve yourself. By working for something that is bigger than you, you not only help others, but you will find that you will help yourself and be rewarded many times over. And third, excellence in all you do. Do your best in everything that you do. Don't ever give up. Keep trying and never quit. Grit, like mom said in the poem. I had to apply to the Academy twice before I was accepted, but it seems to have worked out pretty well. If you live by these three principles, you will be someone others can count on. You will serve a purpose higher than yourself, and you will accomplish more than you ever thought possible. I'm proud of you, and thank you for making the sacrifices that you and all military kids make. I have loved what I've done for these last 28 years, and I have already shared some of the remarkable experiences I've had in the Air Force. Many have sacrificed more than I have. Many have made the ultimate sacrifice, including 16 of our OSI family. Many have done more deployments, have had more family separations, and have taken on more challenging jobs than I have. But none of us serve for the praise or for the thanks, and we surely don't serve intending to make the ultimate sacrifice. We join for all different reasons, and we come from many parts of the country and backgrounds. We come together for a common goal, and we continue to serve because we come to love what we do when we think we can make a difference. That's why we do what we do, despite all the hardships and the sacrifices. I truly believe I have received much more than I have given. In closing, I would like to share two thoughts about how my fellow airmen can help our country today. We must set the example to bring the country together. Today, the military enjoys a tremendous amount of respect and praise from our fellow citizens. While we and our families make many sacrifices, as I've described, maybe the praise is even more than we deserve. Think back before COVID-19, when people frequently said, thank you for your service, when they recognized somebody who was in the military. It has become popular to say many of us serving don't know any different. However, it has not always been that way in our country's history and we must not take it for granted. Instead, we should use it for good and to lead the country during these challenging times. There is no better way to protect our country than to work to close the deep divide that exists in the country today. It has been stated many different ways that there is strength and unity. We have been witnessing jarring events of this divide over the last past week. We should not perpetuate the idea that those who criticize the military 
or use American icons like the national anthem or flag to exercise their First Amendment rights are unpatriotic or anti-military. On the contrary, those of us who serve should understand better than others that we stand to defend those rights regardless of our personal opinions. A few years ago, I read an op-ed in the Washington Post from a retired Army Brigadier General Kim Field, who I had the opportunity to work with when I was on the Joint Staff. General Field put it best when she wrote, the anthem, the flag, the 4th of July are about so much more than the military. Our military exists only to protect the things that make America an exceptional democracy. It should never be waved about to dismiss nonviolent expression of dissent or to deflect important American conversations. As airmen, we must start those conversations. While it is true that those who serve, who have served in the military, make up only about 1% of our population, this is another divide that we can help close. We are not the only ones who serve. It has been become even more plain during the response to the coronavirus that there are many who serve our country in various ways. Doctors, nurses, first responders, teachers, local government employees, and even grocery clerks and small business owners. They, like all of us, do it for both altruistic and self-serving reasons. But they have shown how important their service is to the country as well. As airmen, by recognizing and supporting their service and working together, we close the gap by increasing the common purpose of our service and our goals. Thank you for your service has always made me feel awkward. I'm not comfortable with that kind of praise for just doing my job and doing what I love. But taking my cue from General Field, my response to those who say thank you for your service and to all of you who honor me today by being here virtually and in person, I say it was my privilege. Thank you again to my family, to all those who serve or who have served, and for all of our family and friends who are attending today. Until we meet again. Sir, now I'd like to take my narrator hat off for a few minutes and speak representing the men and women from Colonel Mehta's latest and last assignment, the XR Directorate. The gift is traditionally presented to a departing member of a unit. Sir, given that you are our director, and this is your last assignment, I'm glad to be here in person to present you with a little token from all of us. I want to thank Soup for leading the charge on this. Uh, the gift was inspired by the many trips he and I and many others had to your office. Now, instead of a token from a particular assignment, he had an inspired idea of a gift that can also support the memories from your entire career. So now, when you, for a visual, when you uh, enter Colonel Mehta's office, to the right, you saw a sea of coins decorating his windowsill. I bet many who came in wondered if he had something to hold those coins in. <laughs> so, sir, on behalf of the XR Directorate, uh, please accept a little token of our appreciation for your leadership, direction, and mentorship. You had a lasting impact on not only our staff, but the entire XR team, the, in the engine of the command. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you very much. Right. Thank you very much. You know, I told you not to get me anything, but I know. Yes, sir. It was hard. It's hard to do that. So we, we, we had to break your rule. Thank you, Matt. And thank you, the XR family. It's been a pleasure serving with you in my last assignment. For the final presentation, we will pass on the Officer Special Agent Seniority Trophy. The most tenured in our agent ranks share an honor for being old. I would also add a great deal of respect, especially because of age wisdom or character. Colonel Meta is the current recipient of the Officer Special Agent Seniority Trophy. His picture hangs on the wall at the headquarters as the old guy. 
Said old guy also receives a used trophy engraved with his name for the duration of his term. But those days are over for Colonel Meta and his, with his retirement. Sir, since you are formally retired and now carry an OSI credentials at SESO, you can no longer serve as a senior officer active duty special agent. Brigadier General Lord, you, sir, have now become the old guy. Wait, what, me? Whoa, what happened? When did that happen? Just now. Just now. And your then and now pictures from the Wayback Machine will decorate the Russell Knox building. Colonel Mehta will now present that used trophy oh, to General Bullard, and our photographer, Special Agent Terry Krebs, will record this event for eternal posterity. Oh, wonder, eternal. Wonderful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That had, that had to be uh, that had to be uh, Rich Miller's word. That was absolutely. His <laughs> All right, everybody it's, out there, smile and laugh. <laughs> it's an honor to be handing this off to you. We started out at the beginning. We're finishing together, and you're going to carry this on. And I know that uh, you have an amazing dedication to the command, and amazing stamina to do what you do every day. And the command is lucky to have you as their commander. And I know that OSI will be served well in the future. Thanks, brother. Well, let me tell you, um, my before and after picture doesn't look nearly as good as yours. It'll be nice to actually have a younger picture up somewhere in headquarters, so there is that. Um, but like I said, uh, I consider you the trailblazer. I consider you uh, the leader that I pursued, uh, that I wanted to be the most like. So I will do my best with this. Um, as best I can to hold it down until I can finally pass it on to the next old person. Uh, so, thank you. Let me give you my last salute. Absolutely, man. Thanks, brother. Thank you. Colonel, we thank you for serving our United States Air Force and our nation, and for personifying throughout your career our core values of integrity first, service before self, and excellence in all we do. The men and women of the Air Force and the Office of Special Investigations are proud that, to have served with you, and we wish you and your family every success in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our ceremony. We will end with the Air Force song, and I encourage each one of you to stand where you are and join in proudly singing the Air Force song. Thank you for your virtual attendance, and have a great Air Force Day. Off we go.